I mean, I'll have a certificate leave somebody else to try to for the Medicaid statute. The certificate need was established in the early uh, 70s, and um, um, what it does in a, in a very short order, if you uh, want to uh, build a new hospital or start a new service or purchase any kind of major equipment, you have to go through a planning review and a state review by a state planning agency. And uh, they basically move on now to eliminate that certificate need. In other words, uh, you could you could start, you could put up hospital, you could go to a surgical center, you can do anything you want. Right now, you have to get that approved by a state agency if you want a, a certificate need. Reason and rationale for a certificate need is for hospitals and doctors and others not having a proposition of charity. In other words, uh, building a surgical center and that's all you have, those are paying patients and then they don't receive the uh, the end of the patient of those that are on Medicaid. Hypothetically, if you have everybody going, a pan patient going to a certain facility, and then just say Piedmont, hypothetically, is taking just the end only and coming through, you can see from a financial standpoint what that would be. So the certificate need and the word that we hear more often now than anything is, is create a free market where it's allowing everybody to do whatever they will. And, and healthcare is all, not always, but mostly has been monitored and from that perspective. And so how do we want to eat? In fact, we're working on Monday morning at 8 o'clock. We have another hearing on uh, Friday where uh, several hospitals came to testify pro and con uh, against this legislation and for it. And uh, it's been a, a, um, uh, one of the top issues of this legislative session. Uh, they have a rural development council of uh, the state and hearings in uh, Washington. So this is one of the recommendations of the uh, of the uh, rural hospital of the army of rural development council. So who's going to have a meeting with Medicaid extension? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I know it's early. Just talking about the question. Where do you think that around four hundred are going to be? I can't hear you. They have a building. They have a building. <laughs> they have a building. Oh, they already have the yes. building. Where's that? Well, we're not at Liberty. Oh. Mm. They do have a building. I think they want to do a rollout and announcement. Okay. Oh, this kind of reading on what's happening on the ground, the ground level. Sheriff, about how many students are they expecting that this will bring in? You know, the numbers is, is, is of course, when you when you start a medical school, you have to start small. When you started Mohawk School of Medicine in 1981, we started with uh, 12 students, which are 24, 36, 56, with the 84, now we have 100. And that's from 1980 to 20. So they're going to start small. So, oh, yes, yes, because a medical school is a different type of curriculum, it's a different type of faculty. Uh, it's a different type of research mechanism. So, a med school is a lot different than <coughs> college or you. And you have to have physicians that serve as preceptors, and they have their own personal training. So, they can't really be a preceptor to very many patients. I mean, they have physicians that want to have to take them while they're building. Right. I'm sorry, two heads all at the same time. Will so the medical school have? That is to be determined because when you, when you say full medical school, that means you start at one through four. Um, the the Morehouse program here is a two year program for residency purposes only. Uh, and, and, and I'm, we just not, we just don't, uh, don't know particularly all of the curriculum. Yeah, I think there are some medical schools that are starting off at college level and they have Yes. Yes. Yeah. And Medical College of Georgia, uh, Augusta is an investor. They 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 want to start a three year program where you start getting dual education somewhere else, and when you come, you you further further advanced. And, and the dual program that we have, is some of that goes on that that you are in college and in high school at the same time. Could you 
currently we have some four year Mercer students rotating through the hospitals here in Columbus already. So that's why they knew we were a welcoming yeah. community to students. Um, we have a serious shortage in Georgia for family practice positions, and especially in rural areas where they can be the gatekeeper of your health care and get you to the specialists that you need. And then the other really is you would know, Cheryl, we have a probably the worst shortage of psychiatrists in the nation. So um, they are hoping to do some behavioral health in terms of rotations here and, and help out rather than in other places. Is there going to be a housing development? I'm thinking all of that, just it'll, 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 it'll be a full package, just like any, just like any, you know, college or university and definitely got to have housing and some sort of residential uh, uh, because uh, even in the university system in Georgia now that all of us the, the universities are no longer into quote unquote dogs now people have kind of transitioned into communities dogs in Columbus State they build a residential places and and uh, even downtown, I think they transformed one of the buildings downtown into a, a, a sort of a CSU residential piece of property. So, so there will be, I know they will have some sort of residency program. And we just don't have all of the facts and figures on it, but, but the fact of the matter, um, we, were able to, we, just, it, we were able to appropriate the money in this country. And, and that was in the 2019 budget for the government field time more to get it out of the way. And this this last budget, the budget we just approved, was Governor Deal's last budget. That was the minute budget. Not the budget you'll see in 2020 will be Governor Kemp's budget. And, and one of the things I, I would add to uh, the doctor situation is that I represent a large uh, rural area as well, 60 miles away. Uh, Macon, Marion, Taylor, to the Shrine, all those counties, a huge problem hospital months are closed, uh, no emergency care, so they have to go to either uh, like uh, America's Georgia or come to Columbus, Georgia for emergency care. So these small problems having to trying to hook up everybody by the way of the internet, that will play a part because of telemedicine. But at the same time, there's an effort by uh, the, the people looking at the expansion of doctors too, to have P the PAs involved as well to deliver medical it's a huge issue, and you wouldn't want to be in those areas, and you have a heart attack, not be a stroke, and you don't have access to care. It's, it's a huge problem, and if it's here, uh, if bad problem, it's acute out of those areas. It's a bad problem, and we're trying to do it. So, uh, uh, yes. uh, I know I'm involved more with veterans and forces. Um, what has been done, if anything, about getting a veteran's I believe, I, believe, I, I think, oh, if I'm correct, I believe we're already working at the congressional level with uh, Congressman Bishop and Congressman Drew Ferguson. Ferguson. Uh, there is going to be one located uh, at the old Blue Cross, Blue Cross, Cross. Blue Cross building, and then there's up and coming. So I think that's a part of that. But a lot of people don't like going out for betting because of all the restriction things like that. And you can understand that, but I believe that will begin to answer some of the problem. There's another component to it too that I would like to address later on when we go to another phase about having veterans to get to those facilities and personally if they're sick and uh, they can't get the health care they need, they, they need transportation to get there as well. So I'll address some of those things. If we could, can we one more and then we're gonna move the rest of you. I was going to ask you, uh, you said they shut down the rural hospitals. Is that because they didn't take Medicaid expansion? If they were to Medicaid expansion, would that they the rural uh, hospitals? I think that was going to be a positive impact. There's no, no doubt. It's part of it. Not saying that was similar to the issue, but it would be. It, it's part of the formula. Yeah. And then another one, to be totally fair, you got a population issue there. Yeah. Population, they leave, they come to Columbus, Atlanta, make it simply because, you know, they, when they finish high school, they go to Georgia, wherever, Tennessee, 
and that's it. You know, they don't go back home because there's no jobs and it's a, a drain situation as well. But well, they close because the population is not there. Well, Medicaid expansion, he's not, he, he voted to well, give certain. Uh, what do you call it? He didn't, he, didn't the, he didn't vote for the full Medicaid expansion. That's right. What did he vote to go? You mean you mean the governor? Yeah. He's proposing some waivers. A waiver. Yeah. Well, don't that cost more? Yes. Wouldn't that cost more? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You're not going to get as as yeah. uh, big of a federal match, match. Uh, uh, with, with waivers. federal money to, to 25 percent state money for a waiver in most cases but with the expansion it would be 90 percent federal money and 10 percent state money. so it's a lot more expensive to do the waivers well what we know is that about 300,000 Georgians are stuck in the gap between making too much money to be eligible for the current Medicaid and um, being able to afford private insurance. And there are a lot of companies and there are a lot of people. I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, people would get a job and use their employer's insurance. A lot of people are working that don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. They can't afford the insurance or don't have it offered to them where they work. So we, we even have veterans in that gap that are not covered and do not have coverage for their families. So, I've been a full-fledged cheerleader for Medicaid expansion, and people thought that Medicaid expansion was um, a lot of different things, but basically what it is is expanding the number of people that can be covered by Medicaid so that we have fewer uninsured and more people covered with some type of insurance, which happens to be Medicaid. Um, what we're talking about now, because of the governor's, that's in Governor Kemp's commitment during his campaign was that he did not want to do Medicaid expansion. He wanted to do waivers. He wanted specific programs to cover specific things. Yeah. Um, so, like you might, um, well, in a way, the Medicare for Kids is a Medicaid expansion waiver type. I mean, not expansion, but waiver type program. Um, we have several waiver programs already in place in Georgia, but um, many of us feel very strongly that it makes more sense for us to do the expansion of Medicaid, get the 90% to 10, rather than to go through a very expensive process with a million dollar consultant. 1.6. <laughs> <laughs> program wait a couple of years and that means people are still not covered for a while until that's approved. To answer your question a minute ago about rural hospitals, it is true people are leaving the rural areas and the population is not there to support them, but a major problem with rural hospitals and the fact that they're closing is that they did not have paying customers. Absolutely. They did not have, whether it was Medicaid, private insurance, whatever, you've got to pay the bills at the end of the day they did not have any customers in those hospitals and they were forced to close and they did not have doctors because a doctor that's working in that hospital couldn't have a private practice in town and get paid either and they can't get out of medical school with a three to five hundred thousand dollar payback for schooling and not make that make some money to pay it back does that kind of answer there are two different kinds of waivers which is just a more insurance based, one is more Medicaid and, and service based, but basically they are proposing um, different plans of different types. Uh, they have not put out a detailed plan yet because they have put money in the budget to hire a consultant that will help design those plans and we'll know more later. So this is what it reads uh, the state shall increase funds for an external consultant group. You and Amla have Medicaid waiver options. For the purposes of drafting and preparing paper policy recommendations for approval from the governor's office, the Senate has increased the funds for an external consultant to study the view 
and analyzed Medicaid in Section 1332, a waiver option for the state of Georgia. House recommended one $1 million. Uh, the Senate re uh, recommended $1.6 million. And the conference committee, which we voted on, was $1.6 million. I have a question, a stupid question, probably not, but could this extra consultant, if they were legit, come back and say, you should just do the regular one. Could they do that? They could. 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 They make recommendations on Medicaid waivers, so it's not likely that they would, they would come back with anything other than some type of uh, waiver program. Right. Uh, and uh, the, the difficulty for us as legislators is that in addition to that, the responsibility or the final decision is going back to governor mm -hmm. sure, in terms of sure. who's going to decide what that waiver program is going to be right now. Uh, any expansion would have to go through the, the legislature. Uh, and that was uh, compliments of the prior governor, and that was so that uh, we would not have to do the Medicaid expansion, which all everybody was uh, promoting, and so many other states have gone through too, right? because the uh, majority in our state said that it was going to be too expensive, the federal government might not continue to pay, and on and on and on. Um, but we are several years down the road and we still have uh, people who are not insured, who don't have access to care. Um, we have rural hospitals to close, and when rural hospitals close, you're taking away a major employer uh, from those areas in addition to uh, creating um, isolated areas where people don't have access to health care. So, um, we should not try and oversimplify it because whatever we do, we still have to increase uh, the healthcare professional population, whether it's doctors or, or nurse midwives or uh, uh, other type nurses and other type medical professionals, uh, as well as telehealth to go into these areas in order to make sure that people have access to the appropriate so it's a complicated situation, and I think it's part part of that bill. They're going to continue to do the tax credits for rural hospitals, uh, mm -hmm. which which has been helpful to some. Like that money, right now, is it over 90%? Yeah, 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 they, yeah. Are, they, they are. 290. So if you donate money, then 90% of it is tax. Yeah, tax. Rural hospitals. Yeah, a tax credit tax. Deductible on your taxes, so you get it just by giving money and getting a really good return for yourself, but you're helping the local hospital. And those have been helpful, and they can be used pretty much for anything. They're not restricted to just be used to buy a new piece of equipment. That also leaves money to actually pay salaries. They can be used for that as well. Um, before we leave uh, the issue of healthcare. Uh, the health appropriations uh, segment of the budget, our biggest challenge, um, other than the special <coughs> question, is maternal mortality mm -hmm. here in the state of Georgia. Georgia has a terrible record, uh, and it is one of the highest incidents of maternal mortality here in our state. So uh, that is one of the, the issues that is, is top of our list in terms of what are we going to do about it. We've had several um, programs and um, uh, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, Morehouse School of Medicine, Department of Public Health. Everybody has uh, something that they want us to do in that particular area. Uh, but the fact is that this is not isolated to a particular portion of the state. It's not isolated to a certain socioeconomic class. African American women uh, have a higher incidence, and it doesn't matter 
where that where that person lives or what their social economic status is, it is higher. And so um, one of the uh, recommendations that Morehouse School of Medicine has put forth is they want to do a maternal center of excellence uh, to do research and to come up with what we do and uh, we've already done some work on hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging uh, which was a big factor. Uh, but, they're, but they're also saying that stressors is something that we need to, to look at, particularly as it relates to African American women. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons why they're saying that it doesn't matter their socioeconomic status uh, when it comes to these kinds of things. So that is a, that is a big issue that uh, we, are, we are looking at. And of course, I don't know what's actually going to come out in the budget. We've made recommendations and we, we've uh, indicated our wish list to, our, to the chair. And of course, you know, we say what we want to do, but then it goes up to some room.
special license plates. Um, they have them for their cars, and they want it to go on their motorcycles as well. Their president is one of my constituents, and he has to be Unfortunately, this year we also have a case of a person who was asking for compensation for wrongful conviction. This year, and that's SR 18, and we're working on that for a gentleman by the name of Jakeith Robinson. Uh, and um, we're also working on uh, the claims advisory board because we, we have uh, these cases come up from time to time, and they have to start in the house, and then I have to word my senator. Do something with it when it comes over to the <laughs> to the other side. But as a state, we don't we don't have a, an established process for someone who's been wrongfully convicted. So there is no there is no process such that if a person is wrongfully convicted for five years, ten years, we pay them X amount of dollars once it has been confirmed that that person has been wrongfully incarcerated. Each each request has to go in, and we have to try and figure out what. What, what do you think, Harbison? What do you think, uh, Bob? What do you think, Meyer? What do you think you should do? Now that's stipulation. And mm -hmm. uh, and so and and so as, as a result, not everyone has been treated the same. And so we are, we have a, a bill to try and create a standard. And uh, the chair of appropriations said that he's going to appoint a special study committee so we can look at that to implement and come back with legislation so we can straighten that out because um, there are other cases that I've been contacted on and I know there's uh, a few cases over in Chatham County uh, that are pending as well. But we have to have a standard mm -hmm. such that everyone who is similarly situated will be treated the same. So that's something that, that we're going to be working on. So that's, that's my local stuff. One of the big things uh, this year is, uh, is what we want to do to replace our voting system. Mm -hmm. that, is the, that is the big issue, one of the big decisions that we have to make this year. Uh, and there has been a bill introduced, House Bill 316, by uh, Mr. Barry Fleming uh, from over near Augusta. The bill has uh, passed through the subcommittee and to the committee. Uh, and I anticipate it will be on the floor of the House this week. Um, it's like a 40-page bill, and it, and it uh, has several things in it. And what the bill is recommending is uh, a new system for voting, and the system would be uh, electronic ballot marking devices that will print out a ballot that will go into an optical scanner to count uh, mm. those particular ballots. Uh, and the experts say that the system that is least resistant to tampering is your hand-marked paper ballot counted by optical scanner, which is what I am in favor of. But what's before us is that our market device uh, and you would go in and you would pull who you are, you get a number, you would go to the next station, and your ballot would come up. You would mark that ballot, it would print out for you, you would look at it, see um, if that's what you wanted, and then it would go into a scan. So the experts say that the more uh, computer technology and electronics that you have, more likely the chances of tampering with the system become. And so uh, that is the question that, that we're trying to decide. And uh, there has been uh, some articles uh, to suggest that uh, the vendor that is one of the top vendors, uh, there was a relationship between the person who worked in the uh, Secretary of State's office, now the governor's office, um, with that particular thing, so there was a cloud associated with that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let me just run through and tell you what, what the bill is going to do. Um, we will have a new voting device. Uh, this bill will allow the Secretary of State to join a, a, a multiple state organization whereby they can share information from one state to the next so that if I move from Columbus over to Alabama, then they will know that, and I registered to vote in Alabama, and then they know that they get all the votes to the next um, And um, so that's one of the things that's, that's in um, the bill as well. The other thing is, uh, right now, there are 200, or at least the standard is, one voting booth per 200 people. And this bill would move that from one per 200 to one per 250. And I told you steps which more steps you need to do now. So that means, in my mind, it's going to take you a little bit longer to vote, not less, not less time. So that's, that's another concern um, with that particular bill. Um, and then um, the bill talks about absentee ballots, and, and you know, the signature matching issue came up time and time again. Uh, and there have been some um, slight modifications to that, which make it a little bit better. Uh, because if there is a signature mismatch, they got to first determine whether or not it was a, an error on the part of the election division that entered the information first. And then, um, then uh, the person can get a provisional ballot. So they wouldn't be stopped from voting and they would get a provisional ballot. They would be notified of the discrepancy and they would have an opportunity to appear. This is actually a quick year of voting documentation in July. I am uh, another um, provision um, is that um, when there is a recount, and I'm going to yield so somebody else can talk, but when there is a recount, right now it's an automatic recount if there is a 1% difference, and they're going to reduce that to 0.5% difference. So that means you'll have fewer recounts under this proposal uh, that we have. Uh, uh, one of the good things is that this bill would uh, require a post audit. With the DRE machines we have now, you cannot do a post audit to make sure that the person, the votes are as the voters intended for them to be. Because it's all an electronic system, and whatever you put in the first time, Whatever, what you're going to get out the second time. With, with this system, um, you should be able to count the actual ballots to make sure that the machine and the ballots are, are in alignment. So uh, that's that's basically where, what, what we're talking about. Um, and uh, anybody else that I'm missing? Just the bill was a great job. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Make, their, make, them make, them, make themselves whole. Mm -hmm. So 
So you take out the private payer part and you leave hospitals like you leave the intensive care hospitals, the designated intensive care hospital, with only um, Medicaid patients, they're not going to be able um, to, to make their budget. And it would affect the indigent and charity care. It also would, you know, like that what was prohibited, like an emergency room standard room only, you know, like of course that's an emergency room just for emergency room purposes. So things of that nature, the specialty, you have to be licensed now to do that. So that's what the certificate needed to sort of try to create a level field, so to speak. That's what it is. Uh, something Butler. A, a major part of that is equipment involved in the hospitals. I'm just talking about I just want to say one thing, big issue is that equipment has a tremendous loss of equipment. I think that was another reason the CON factor came in. It plays a major role. It's a huge equipment cost. And some of it, I think we saw some extra issues about two big. So that seal in would curtail, try to curtail that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, you, no, you. Oh, okay. I, I think the important thing to avoid duplication of services, right? So one, and help keep health care obviously those that's that major services is what makes it. Okay. And, and that, that, that the second issue the health care costs, that's the, and, and once you eliminate this, you look forward to and just to finish that before I start on my list, um, <laughs> the cherry picking when you refer to that, especially in the rural areas, the rural hospitals are paying them by three most of the time. So they are very afraid of, say, a group of doctors coming in and filling ambulatory surgeries that are outpatient <clears> services <throat> so that they could then do the the more routine, simple procedures in that outpatient facility and take that away from the hospital. The people that would go to that outpatient center would typically be your private pay patients. So that would leave the people that are on Medicare and Medicaid, which pay about 85 cents on the dollar for the hospital to pay. That's what the rural hospitals are really afraid of with this bill. Okay. With the new discussion about uh, payroll system, payroll balance set up. There is a there is a bill that's been introduced. It's House Bill 433 uh, that we signed on to uh, because that is uh, the preferred method, uh, but that is not the bill that is before us. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, we're going to continue to advocate for the, the paper ballot uh, because that is, as I said, the least tamper resistant way to go. And then the other thing, you know, how often, how often does this thing right here become out of date? Yeah. And so, when, when, you know, technology, by the time we deploy this across the state, it's already going to be out of date. But because it's going to cost so much, the last system we had we used for 15 years. Uh, so that's that's the other thing that concerns me is, is uh, the after purchase costs associated with maintenance and, and upgrades and, and all of that. And, and we know that large employers, they don't buy Systems like they don't have systems, they need them because they're going to be out of date. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's that's something else that we need to concern ourselves with as a state because we, you know, we, we won't be able to make this large purchase uh, over and over and over and over again. I'm passing this baton to you. It's the third day of the so I'm just going to get a list of several things that people talk to me about in random order. Uh, a lot of people have been concerned over the years and 
fact that like when you go and buy new tires, you have to pay a fee. And you're told that that goes into the solid waste trust fund. And then you find out that that money's not used to deal with solid waste issues or, or hazardous waste issues, that kind of thing. Uh, there was a bill that's already passed in the House that's gone to the Senate and it's to put the trust back in the trust fund. In Georgia, we do have a law where unless it's a constitutional amendment where it is voted on by the people that the money is dedicated to a certain thing, we can't do that. Um, we can kind of make a promise that that's what we plan to do, but if hard times come, we have to move the money around. It just goes into the general fund. This is a way to say that we will use it, the money in, that is put into the trust fund for the designated use that we have said, except and in case of an emergency, and there are certain guidelines that are set out in the bill. So um, the Senate will be taking this up. It's something that people have asked for for a number of years. We've tried to get it passed a number of years. And it's on its way. Another thing that um, quite a few people in Columbus have asked for, and I actually got a call on the way down this morning. In the Chattanoochee River, there is a fish that is known to Georgians as the shoal bath. The shoal bath is the Georgia fish. It is not found in other states. It's found in the Okanagan, the Flint, and the Chattanooga. We almost lost it, but it has come back. It got down the stream too far and wasn't in the shoals. So we, they, the scientists moved it back up into the area where it could thrive. And uh, there is a bill to name that as the state riverine sports fish. It really should be our state fish instead of the largemouth bass because there are largemouth basses in every state. But this is specific to Georgia. Special Georgia fish. Special Georgia fish. And the reason we are doing this is a request. Well, it started out as a school request from a school up in Merriweather County that I also represent, Flint River Academy. And they thought that it was very important because it was the only consulting town in Georgia. We tried to get it passed and that didn't work. Um, and then we, so now what's happened is we have sports fishing guides, canoe, kayakers, people with hotels and, and small business owners all up and down these rivers that have asked if we could get it a special designation, they could use it as a problem. So in an attempt to help a lot of small business owners across the state, we're trying to get the special designation for them. And our, 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 um, our um, Chattahoochee River Conservancy here in Columbus is a supporter of the legislation. <clears throat> okay, I got one more. Um, because this one, this one may be um, of interest as well. There's a lot of environmental <laughs> emphasis being put on coal ash and coal ash ponds in the state of Georgia. There is one in the metro Atlanta area that's very close to the Chattahoochee River, and it's on um, private property owned for the for the power company. Um, they are in the process of doing what's called dewatering, where they take the water out of these ponds, and then they're left with the ash. The ash is considered by the federal government as as municipal waste or solid waste and can go in a regular landfill. Um, many of us are concerned because they have found other things that, that are kind of dangerous to one's health. And we feel very strongly that that ash needs to be put into line landfills so there's less likelihood of it leaching into the groundwater. So there's a big conversation about the coal ash ponds in Georgia about what's going to happen when the water is when it's dewatered and what's going to happen to the ash. So just so you'll know, there is one that could impact Columbus and our water in the Chattahoochee, but um, it, it, it's okay right now, and then they're taking care of it, and they've dewatered the pond so that when rain comes, it won't wash into the river. But all that ash needs to be moved into a lined landfill instead of being in that unlined pond. And then, <laughs> well, this is the one that everybody knows about. There is a bill called House Bill 8. House Bill 8, um, for many women, have been talking to me about this all across the state, and we have received national publicity, and we have, it has been endorsed by conservative and liberal groups. But this is what happened was um, it was brought to me by a uh, 
group of women that are in the Georgia Junior League, uh, Georgia mm -hmm. women and those who stand with us, uh, a variety of sororities. Uh, uh, it's, it's the petition has 10,000 women, Georgia women, can mm -hmm. sign it saying that they want the sales tax removed off of feminine hygiene products. <laughs> feminine hygiene products are a medical devices administration and um, they should be put in the code in that section and then when that happens it will automatically get the sales tax exemption. So I have been working on that and I just want to say this Two years. as a result of putting that bill in play and asking for that exemption, we found out about three other issues. One was that um, FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency allows for some of their funds to be used for basic human needs expenditures, which includes diapers for adults and, and disabled um, children's diapers and for feminine hygiene products. Georgia has not adopted those same rules. So we are now in the process of getting that taken care of. So when the next God forbid Michael comes through, there will be any funding that's needed to take care of the basic human needs of people will be a part of the rules and regs for G. The other thing we found is that in our state prison, there was a limited supply to the women given, very limited supply given to the women to use at that time. And they have now lifted that and made it where they can have the supplies that they need. And all of that happened as a result of the bill without legislation. Our final thing that we have to address is the fact that we are finding out that there are a number of young women that are missing a lot of time from school every month because they don't have what they need. And we are trying to get a handle on the number of um, young girls that do not go to school because they don't have the supplies and how we can distribute them. And these are problems that I never thought would be things we would have to be talking about and dealing with in 2020 or 2019 or 2018. So they need to be addressed because we do need, do not need the young girls to miss a week a month of school. So, and with that, I'll throw it over to you. So, well, well, see you soon. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I'll start off where uh, Representative Buckman left off. And in my committee, uh, there was a bill submitted in. Like she said, it's something you didn't necessarily think about, but it came to my committee, state institutions and property, in the, in the capital itself, there was no place for a woman to go to breastfeed a child. And so, uh, let's say in that category, had young babies and things that needed, tend or need to be fed and things like that. So we passed a bill saying right now we will establish a place like that and every level so women have that access. You won't have to go to their cars to have privacy to do that. So we pass that bill and we think it's on a fast track. It's gonna go and go to the house pretty soon, I'm sure we're gonna pass it out. The uh, the second thing that I want to deal with uh, was an issue that a bill that really sort of shot through the general assembly real fast. It came up because of a bill that we probably passed in haste we didn't think it out fully. Uh, it was dealing with school buses. And the school buses really uh, had uh, the law sort of was like this that if you were in a four lane highway and uh, you had to stop, uh, all lanes had to stop. We passed a bill that saying if there was a turn lane in that particular lane, that they could uh, turn lane in close to the close before you got there, they could turn either way in any direction but the other traffic had to stop. It was so confusing until we had something like 7,000 violations reported by bus drivers. So we reversed it. Now all lanes must stop, which which makes sense. It's just, it's just you know, and it really was confusing because I thought anyway, I just stopped because I thought everybody had to stop. So as a consequence of that bill, uh, we, we passed it. As a matter of fact, the governor has already signed that bill, which we, we made an error in that bill. Then now all of the children are safe because of that bill that's passed. And I'd like to commend Senator Heath for that bill 
he's from the fed for Senator E most knowing everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he does. He, he's one of those guys that votes no, 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 no. Uh, and so we, he voted yes for that. He led the fight for that. So mm -hmm. I was just really surprised about that. Um, I also wanted to go to um, uh, the $200 million that we had the budget that was being passed. As a matter of fact, the budget, the little budget you mentioned, I think someone mentioned that earlier. The 200 million to aid farmers, they were really devastated by that mm -hmm. micro that came to them. They were just, some of them will never go back into farming. It may, uh, you think it may not affect you, but it does. Uh, yeah, that's one of our number one um, um, projects in the industries in the state of Georgia. Uh, agriculture, it really is. And you have dedicated farmers who do it year after year, day after day. And I think this will help them. Some of them know they'll never go back in business and they will always be out there. Uh, so those three items I just wanted to bring up. Uh, my bill uh, dealing with uh, a lottery uh, game for veterans is now in finance. That bill, as some of you heard about veterans, is designed to be one that is not complicated, is not controversial, it should be in place. It is simply a, a vehicle that we can fund the efforts of a lot of, of organizations, the USO, the DAB, American Legion, any of those organizations who would be vetted before they got grants to provide buses of transportation to people who need better. There are a lot of veterans out there live by themselves. Uh, the wives and the, the husband have died and vice versa, and they are sickly and ill. They can't get to the VA. They can't get to a fire. They can't get to Tuskegee. They can't get to the new facility that will be up in North Columbus uh, on Wound Spring Road. But they need help getting there. This would be one to a large that particular problem. So uh, I believe it will fly. Uh, I think it's got a tough road to hold, so to speak. But I believe if we all get together, you make your feelings known about it, I believe we'll be able to push it through in some form or another. It may not be what it leaves out to be. Almost no bills are. But I believe it will make an impact, make a dent in, in Columbus, Georgia. We, we are a military town. And so the last thing we should be lacking in is aid to those people who serve their country. Retiring veterans who are now confirmed and need help. I believe this will be an effort to do that. I got Democrats and Republicans to sign on it, men, veterans, women, veterans. So I meet with the governor next month, talk about it, hopefully we can get a nod on it so we can get it over. So. That's my speech. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Harvard Division uh, Agriculture, of course, has built a top industry in Georgia. Uh, number two is called tourism. And uh, then number three is um, uh, if you were to add all the military bases up, because you only look at Fort Bend. You were said the nine military bases. You were pulling together from an economic standpoint, twenty-five billion dollars in the economic benefit of George. I hear in in Fort uh, Benton, it's approximately one hundred and twenty-five million dollars per month payroll. So you can see what if there were no Fort Benton, what the impact would be on Columbus. So it would be it would be significant. Then the former largest is 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 high end. We have all the CSUs of the state of Georgia. Economic benefactor would be approximately uh, 18 billion. Uh, and here, Columbus CSU is approximately 400 million dollar economic uh, engine to this city. Well, let's think about that. So, so you can see all these sectors: the agriculture industry, there's a direct benefit to Columbus, Georgia. So that's why we look at these industries and try to assist.
Yeah. There's a conversation there. There's a conversation. Yeah. This is going to hold. It's going to be released okay. uh, within the next day or two. Right. There's a poll that has been commissioned to, to, to do a scientific poll that has been finished. Okay. And I've seen some of the, the, the bullet points on it. And uh, it's, 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 it's going to be revealed to the public. And, and in that part, it was the question should you join us? That's the issue we've seen, though. And, and, uh, and, and so what pushed the envelope down in the Senate that is a horse racing field. Parameter mutual bail. Now, uh, a lot of people think horse racing has a better chance of passing than casino. Now, with that, because of the agriculture, the equilibrium, and all that. So, so horse racing may, I don't know what temperature it may run. Rural areas that are very impoverished. 
left. There are two or three that are in places. There's, there's McDonald's is in Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah, there are some impoverished people living around that in the metro area. So yeah, it's that one in town, if you will, and it has um, large volumes of ash that they're having to deal with. We, I, I'm very aware of what you're talking about. Yes. It is very concerned about the. Alpo was so powerful. It was amazing. He and his daughter came down, and they really did go on the tour with Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign. So it's like North Carolina and Alabama and Virginia. Uh, I don't think they're coming to Georgia, but they will be before in Atlanta in mid March. And so I plan to head back. Because the environmental issue is really important. And it really looks good to see how going yeah, out of and how much better they get after they're not in those positions. Right. Like Jimmy Carter, Al Gore, they look really good stuff these days. Really good stuff. Thank you. Um, <laughs> first, per, uh, per, the first question I want to ask is uh, it's going to be on behalf of our initial book. Oh, sir? On behalf of Alicia Wilson, who couldn't be here, she has a uh, second chance uh, in life. Uh, she asks, um, with Justice Day at the Capitol coming up on this Tuesday, the 26th, there are a large number of criminal justice reform bills on the floor. Can you please tell us which, if any, of these CJ reform bills that will actually help those with criminal records who are returning to society, will you be so strongly supporting and why? Oh, you'd have to tell me the bill number. And uh, specifically, what you're talking about, where you sign the bill. And see, some of the bills are in that. They're introduced, but they may never go into place. So we need to know where they are and how they And we're glad to ask this way, because I think she does great work. Okay. And we don't have the uh, 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 civil, uh, civil Justice Committee, not Senate, you know, yeah, the yeah. 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 Well, and keep in mind, this is neither Senate nor House. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, we are at the midst of this, and everything that's been mentioned to us has to go before crossover day, which is day 28. So uh, we will see a lot, of, lot more bills come through over the course of the next week. So the bill has to go through the committee that it's assigned to, then it will come to consideration for rules. And, and Mrs. Meyer and I sit on rules on the House side. We don't have any of those bills sitting on the rules council. Now, but, okay. but that will change when we go back Monday. We'll get a new batch right. of bills, so we will be on the lookout for them, and, and they may or may not come before the day of amnesty is announced. Right. Well, the voting bill for the voting machine. Did you have anything to have about taking people off the voting rolls? He was uh, secretary of state. He took the media people off the voting rolls. If they do address that in the bill right now, um, they have increased the the time period by two years mm. uh, before a person can be taken out of the voting bill. Uh, and and you know that's not ideal, but it's better than than what we have now. So that is one of the things that they have adjusted in this bill uh, that that is before that's going to be come before the house. Before I think I'm like they could do a purge. I don't know. Any, not any time. Well, right now it's after three years. So now it's going to be after five years uh, of inactivity. So, you know, voting is a thing I use for a living. Uh, and so um, they, they've uh, widened that period out by a couple of years. Have they always chose this voting machine? Did they have two or three other different kinds? Well, what, what's going to happen, the deal will allow them to go out for RFP. And uh, the way they design that will determine how many uh, vendors that can meet that requirement. And uh, this area is kind of narrow and specific. There are like three companies that are able to do what we're asking for, what this deal is asking for. Mm -hmm. 316. 316. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Please talk about putting one machine for 200 people, 250, and that just seems like she'll make a lot of 
licensure and, uh, and, and, uh, and cultivated for those purposes, those express purposes. Now, there are steps. When things happen in New York, California, and Denver on the West Coast, when they happen there in 2018, it takes Georgia to 2025. But but that is a possibility there. And and, and these legislators tell you it was not until they brought those kids down there and into that chamber in those wheelchairs who have seizures. Because these parents were driving what to Colorado mm -hmm. and coming back with their with their families and some families moving out there. Mm -hmm. And so that next session a kid sitting in the chamber and uh, and testimony is going on, it's just too powerful of an object for us to take. And and so that that passed it, but now the cultivation of it shows you how serious the general who promoted cultivation. Was the floor being to the government? Was. 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 And I, my specific question is, the Florida Entertainment Congress was recently formed by Representative Erica Thomas and announced January 22nd. Um, to me, they're mostly focusing on Atlanta, Georgia, um, a dozen of maybe Savannah, but my main priority is how are you with Columbia, Georgia? That's why we own the Youth Legend Awards at this city. Um, what is it that we can do on our end uh, in the public and for civic to Create a better relationship between the entertainment execs who have formed this particular conference, but it leaves out those who are not entertainment execs. And so the music organization, along with a lot of other organizations that we have found around the state of Georgia, they have a voice, but it's very different. So, what can you all do to help us in that part? Let me tell you something that happened last week. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to members of the and to Representative Thompson. They were not aware that some special tax incentives that were given for, for big Broadway shows to come to local theaters, they were not aware that the Springer Theater here in Columbus is the state theater of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And the, the parameters of that tax credit are so large, the only place they're applicable for it is Box in Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, Hamilton. Yeah. Hamilton. Well, so, the only one that qualified. The only one that So we have had, while it may not be enough because it's just the beginning, but we have had a conversation and educated them at least to know that the state theaters here and, and that needs to be fixed so that we can do some some Broadway shows here in Columbus mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in Albany and other places. Look up House Bill 347. That's a bill and uh, if you were to try to do, put a production on music now, you would have to be the threshold of a half a million dollars to qualify, which none of that did other than Hamilton. Hamilton was regarded as was a huge production. So Hamilton qualified for it, but, but nothing in Columbus, Savannah, or Augusta. And I want to give Dallas Austin credit for Columbus, Georgia. <clears throat> and he didn't get the credit he deserved, but Dallas Austin was the first person that entered the country. About tax credit for film industry. Mm. Now, he had done uh, drum line right. and participated in others. He came to us and said that you all ought to give tax credit to the movie industry because that will grow this, that will grow Georgia and the, the industry. We were doing zero in film. Mm. And we introduced the bill, Ron Stevens and others, and it was stopped by the governor. Mm -hmm. And he brought it back next year as a lawyer. As his mission, the the first person, Ron Stevens, will tell you that the chair of the England Development Committee. And I welcome him. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
and now from zero to 10 billion. Mm. 10 billion dollar industry is now in the top 10 industries of the state of Georgia. If you this, if you drive in Atlanta, they'll tell you every other block is blocked somewhere. You got to go around those city trucks and lights everywhere. You can't move around Atlanta because all these buildings were blocked. It was snowing in the neighborhood. It was snowing in the neighborhood. I went home from the Capitol and I rode by, and it was literally snowing. There was snow on the ground. <coughs> there were Christmas decorations on all the houses, just a block from where I studied that they were filming. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna let we're gonna let you close this out. You're gonna get the last question. Come on, my man. Tell us who you are. My name is
person who made them from starting to eight point. So he could have come and could have edited us to see how we do it all on this side of the world. But if you will leave me your information, I will get your information to him so he can help you. Thank you. All right, that's the my second question is where are there any laws um, currently that are um, enacted in the schools to have better protection um, against dogs and mass shootings? Yes, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yes, we see no thing. You're in Alabama and we're in Georgia, so mm -hmm. so but in Georgia, we we, we have. We, I forgot the numbers. I forgot the number, but thirty dollars per school to go in for equipment, scanning equipment, surveillance equipment, things of that nature. And it was a grant at the state of Georgia. Help me with them now, y'all. It's thirty thousand per school. I mean, but um, several million dollars. Yeah. Thirty thousand per school. And and it will be tailored to the needs of that particular school because every everybody's school not necessarily. Georgia home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's your last question? Um, oh, that should be. Thank you so much. Is there a car? So this is my son. He's Yale, Princeton, and so many other teams are very busy. You're part of them. And how it was, I appreciate you, but don't move to my district, all right? <laughs> <laughs>